sort of kick things off here at the chamber. My name is Riley Burton. I'm the current chair of the board for the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So first and foremost, thank you to the candidates. Thank you for your, your willingness to serve our community and uh, for taking time to be here today. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement as we uh, sit in this nice room and look out at the beautiful sleeping giant on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, let's recognize that uh, our enjoyment of this area has come at a cost due to the impact uh, over the years of colonization. And with that, I would like to say that the city of Thunder Bay has been built on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe, people of Fort William First Nation, the original signatories for the Robinson Superior Treaty signed in 1850. And we recognize the significant contributions of the First Nations. Inuit and Métis peoples for heritage, social, cultural, spiritual, and economic wealth. A special thanks to our uh, luncheon series sponsor, Inner City Industrial Supply, for their support of this event. Thank you. Certainly like to recognize our other chamber board uh, board directors in the crowd. We've got Anna and Tanushi is here. And with the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Foundation, Dr. Andrew Dean is here from Lakehead University. And we have Jason Thompson with Superior Strategies. All right, we are recording, obviously, so it'd be wonderful if you could uh, have your cell phones on silent for the duration of the, of the event. That includes you, candidates. Um, we would ask our audience to please stay quiet during the questions and responses. And people will be looking to, to listen intently, right, to inform their vote. Applause, of course, is permitted at the conclusion of each uh, candidate's response, if you see fit. The order of speaking has been determined by draw. And questions will rotate from left to right. Each candidate will have 60 seconds for their answer. And our timekeeper will raise a notice card when there are 10 seconds left. And we will then cut you off if time runs out. I remind the candidates that they have pledged to be respectful of each other, to not engage in name calling, and to not interrupt each other when speaking. Although that would also be entertaining. We're going to uh, avoid that. <laughs> Candidates will not use inappropriate language and will follow the direction of the moderator. Your candidates today are Mr. Ken Boschkoff, Mr. Clinton Harris, Mr. Gary Mack, Robert Chapansky, and Hung Yu. We'll now pass the microphone over to our moderator, Charlotte Robinson, the president of your chamber. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you, candidates. Get everything adjusted. So we are uh, ready to go. Just want to let everybody know that the questions for today have been formulated with input from our membership survey, the city's, uh, the chamber's city of opportunity platform, as well as submissions from attendance uh, in the room today. So we've got a real broad range of things to cover. Can, uh, candidates, you'll need to push the push button when you're going to speak, and please turn it off as well when you are done so that we don't get a bunch of feedback. So you want to just test that now and see if you can get the green light to go. Okay. Talk. Hello. Do you have the lunch yet? <laughs> That's good. Gary, do you want to test yours? No. Thank you. Robert? No. Perfect. Okay. So let's get started. In lieu of an opening statement, we're going to start by providing each candidate with 30 seconds to respond to the question, why are you running for mayor? And we will start with Hung Yu. Hung, 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm a councillor at large and a small business owner. I'm very aware of the current issues that we face 
and the opportunities that are available. I'm ready to hit the ground running with the whole vision, positive energy, leadership, experience, and a strong allies with all levels of government. I strongly believe that together we can grow a city. Time's up. Thank you. Mr. Oshkoff, you have 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. And one thing we can all agree upon in this room is that we all believe in our community and we all agree in the future of our city. However, to get there, we will need leadership with experience. We will need someone who can coalesce the region into a formal uh, group that will make its case because. Our issues are regional. When we talk about all of those things, one thing we know for sure, we have potential and the city is ready. Thank you, Mr. Mack. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mack. Senator is facing some unprecedented challenges and a ton of options now. I'm excited to learn from here because I believe I have a unique skill set, knowledge, and experience to lead us through these difficult times. I think it has been plagued by social problems. It's been social for 25 years, including the areas of health, uh, uh, homelessness, and uh, substance use. I'm very familiar with those issues, and I know the way that we can work forward together to resolve them. Thank you very much. Robert Chiklansky. The reason I'm running is because politics in the past 20 years has become stale. It's become about let's keep the status quo. Let's keep the status quo. I'm the youngest candidate up here. I'm the one who's running because I feel it's time for the new generation to take over. We need genuine, honest change. We need a better life for the average citizen, and the average citizen is me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, to be honest, it started when a uh, friend of mine, Carolyn Carl's daughter, died of fentanyl overdose. It's evolved since then. I'm watching the crime, the other guns, gangs coming in, and domestic terrorism on our streets. The uh, discussions with contractors and builders, the culture of saying no to new business coming to our community, uh, we've done enough of that. So I've led a lot of teams. It's time to have some success. Thank you very much. Okay, our first question, again, you have one minute for the response. Our first question, we'll start with him and then uh, proceed towards the right table, coming back to and with him. So to Ken, community safety and well-being is an issue of significant concern for chamber members. Business owners and employees are witnessing an increase in property crime, substance abuse, poverty, and homelessness around their operations and across the community. As mayor, what solutions will you put forward to address these issues? Can't I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to first say that we know now quite convincingly that we are a gathering point and as our, the regional aspect of our of our influx of people coming in is something that can be resolved with a lot of cooperation with the outlying municipalities and First Nations. And what we need is a leader who can coalesce uh, the response to this so that when we pressure provincial and federal governments, uh, we know that we're servicing an area larger than Germany and France. And for us to try to do it and take on all the responsibilities as a municipality is simply unfair. Gary. Community safety is a concern of all of us. And one of my platform on pillars is to um, address these issues by um, creating a new tier of first responders who can go out and uh, address the, um, the homelessness, all the non-criminal, non-violent things that we serve. It's taking up least time. So we can then focus on the serious crime that's happening in our community, the guns, the gangs, the opiates. Um, there's something like 50,000 calls received by police every year. Most of those are non-criminal, non-violent. They can be handled very well by somebody else. So I would be free up their time and then have them focus on the service. Thank you. Robert? Thank you. I believe that in order to achieve safety for the community, we have to first ask ourselves what causes crime. In our city, uh, there is a huge, huge margin between the upper class and the lower. 
people will work, 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 and still have to choose between food and rent. So in order to make that money for food, what other options are there? Not only that, but with mental health being such a joke in this city, we need to address that because if we help people with mental health, then we'll reduce people who, for lack of a better description, have to self-medicate. If we reduce self-medication, we reduce the amount of illegal drugs sold. If we reduce the amount of illegal drugs sold, we reduce the amount of drug dealers. It's a, one of the few times in the world where trickle-down economics works. Thank you. Thanks. Well, if you look at the past administrations over the last three or four of them, promise have been made to solve a lot of these issues. Compassion has been worked. So if you look at the map and compare to the duplication of people responding to calls, the expense that we involved in that. You start looking at it as a business sort of venture, the cost that could be saved solving these solutions as opposed to 10 years, we're hoping to solve them. And we can actually start growing this community by actually fixing these issues. And uh, create a revenue source that will actually help us to grow. Thank you. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Thank Much power. So yeah. Uh, this is a very serious issue. If we don't head on, have some solution short term and long term that we can not grow a city you know attract more new businesses so i do believe something we can do is from bottom up neighborhood and also policing neighborhood policing that works cut down uh crime rate by 27 percent some of the tools we had why don't we keep you know, use it another part is we can take care of little ones when they come home they have a Love food on the table. Otherwise, we won't go to see a, tra a track. One thing, something simple. Don't have to be fancy. For example, city standard B administration. We can do one thing very simple. Put the light, bright light at common and most common street. For example, from a red river to river, we can do that. Those are simple things we can add on real stuff. Don't just talk on the table strategy. We need to look after our police officers in the front line. Thank you. All right. Moving on to question. Moving on to question two, uh, which we'll start with Gary. Many of the solutions or supports for our social issues are dependent on funding from federal and provincial governments. What steps will you take as mayor to ensure that Thunder Bay receives the financial support we need to address these issues? To address our social issues, what we really need is a plan as a city to be able to move that forward. We're not going to be doing is starting a, a task force immediately once I'm elected, a task force to end chronic homelessness in Thunder Bay. I think it's doable. Other cities have done it. They've done it with database systems where they track all of their, um, um, all of the people that are homeless. Uh, what I believe that we can do though is once we have a plan, there are monies available at the federal level that we can um, uh, bring that plan to. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, Sorry about that. Um, we're also executive director at Shelter House. We, um, we had to say the SOS program is a not funded program. And what I did was I brought together Indigenous organizations, Indigenous uh, communities, um, multiple levels of government, and the private sector. And we all worked together in a very short period of time. We ended up saving that program. We raised $180,000 in no time and had that program by helping money. I believe that we can do the same thing to solve our other issues. We all come to the table. Time's up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Robert? Uh, I believe one of the biggest things I could do is in the past, uh, when politicians in the city have been asked, uh, how do we address the homelessness problem? How do we address the addiction problem? They responded with, what problem? No, I don't see any problem. There's no problems. And they're the ones who will address. A, a report directly to provincial and federal government saying it's like, no, no, we actually do need help. So first thing I'm going to do is basically scream at the provincial and federal government. And it's like, hey, the last guy didn't know what he was talking about. We are in a mental health and homeless crisis. We need help. And like, like uh, Gary right here said, a uh, uh, task force to help uh, homeless people. Not, not homeless anymore. And like, 
get them into programs and help genuinely help them just use the platitudes of, well, there's a service and if you're not using it, that's your fault. No, people actually need to be told because a lot of people don't know what's going on because they don't have access to this information. We got to go out there and talk to them face to face like real human beings. Thank you. Thanks. Well, currently the silence from our, our federal and provincial leaders is happening. Um, we have opportunities in this community with taking space so that we can actually make a difference and, and get people at home. I remember the child shelter out yesterday, he's half full with the amount of homeless where he receives 50% of the funding. Uh, the situation with regards to the silence and the responsibility of our federal and provincial government. Um, half of the crimes being committed by people who are coming from outside our city. We, we eventually have to put up a roadblock to stop it from happening or get the resources because we can't afford the cost that they occur in regards to the increases in the hospital, the increases in the jail, the increases in the courts. Um, it has to end at some point and then we begin with the, making them speak out and actually provide the resources to the city that we need. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Hayes. We cannot do it alone. We have been putting a lot of resources and money there already. That's three reports. It's already that community partnership. It's about $40 million, $4 million, 50% of tax levy. We need a group for, to support the tax base. And also, we need the collaborations together with the upper level of our government, level of government. I have a strong relationship with them. I even talked to Minister Tobello. He's coming this week, this month. We discuss mental health of grand issues. We will decide more. We have to ask more support, resources for not just for current issue and for the future generation. I can see this very serious issue is come. It's not just a homelessness now, it's a future. More people, they have a home, they may have no money to pay for it. High inflation, high cost. How can they pay for that? We need a group. We need to collaborate with the upper level government. I talked to Premier about that issue. He said, you are right. We need the good jobs, we pay jobs, we need the good support. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we already have the political tools to do this. The organizations, NOMA, the municipal leagues, uh, already exist. And it's a matter of having a leadership and a coalescing of that support because with the potential is only uh, as strong as us standing together. As people who have issues filter into our community, uh, we also have not utilized uh, the unknown power of uh, the First Nations. Uh, we have a large number of very articulate chiefs and organizations, and I truly believe uh, that our strength is in coalescing people together and in presenting a formidable uh, position to provincial and federal agencies, ministers, and letting them know that we can solve this if we have the support. The next question goes for Robert. Under many businesses are facing an unprecedented shortage of labor. We know that the New arrivals, whether through employer attraction or as international students at Lincoln University and Federation College, bring a positive economic and social benefit to our community. What is your plan to ensure that Thunder Bay is a welcoming community that can attract and retain newcomers? So one of the things I've learned over my years of you know, actually working real jobs is that the reason people don't want to work most quote unquote large jobs is for their minimum wage. If we actually pay people a fair, decent living wage, oh man, would people be flocking in and coming in for work? Because you can't live off minimum wage. You just can't. It's impossible. So if we, as a city, decide, hey, let's raise our wage or you know create more, I'm not even going to say high wage jobs, just actual livable wages, then we can attract, attract people to do work regardless of what it is. I can't be an answer. Just, just take people with their work. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Well, I don't disagree with the wage issue. Obviously, the other entrepreneurs have been an issue here. But we welcome people and want people to come to our community. I think the last thing you want to see is when they group up in the nation with a work capital campus. Our issue with double homelessness, the situation with regards to 
these people that don't want to go to work after the government gave them a certain amount of money for a period of time not to go to work. And we created that culture. Now we're living with that culture. How do we encourage them to want to be here? We need to make sure that we have a welcoming city that looks like we take care of our vulnerable. And that they see that we're a worthwhile family doing business. Right now, if I do a Thunder Bay and I look somewhere else, the last thing I want to do is tell my family, let's go move there and have a look how well they're taking care of their people. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. 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 Thank We have to welcome. We have to uh, the people come here to do this. We have to care for image, and we have to focus on customer service. Those are very important. Another important issue is house shortage, affordable house shortage. We have to deal with that. We have land. We have a, a developers. We need a policy. Lots of policy is not we make the decision. It's a provincial. So we have to have a stronger collaboration. Deal with. Special special policy for the north. We must do that. Another part is we have to deal with we call very important the driving engine called indigenous real true conciliation, which is more young generation are indigenous. We train them in the school, it's not enough. They need the skill, engineer, management, financial was a premiership. So government have money for that. And then hope one day they can do it's not just like a, on the paper, also true business. Okay. It's not sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have the potential here of seven new mining operations close to our community. Our competition is the city of Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. So are we ready for success? Are we preparing for success? When you want to address these issues. Uh, the first thing you do is you build a successful city. So those are the positive things that are no longer pipe dreams. These are realities and potentialities that are on the verge. So we have to show the leadership. We have to show we have the coalescing of forces that wants to deal with them. So are we prepared? Are we prepared for the competition? We'll say you guys aren't ready. Well, we need a mayor who will lead us in that, who will bind the region together, and who will go after these firms in their head offices and tell them this is the best place you could possibly invest. Thank you. Gary? In order to attract, in order to attract a workforce to the city where people want to come and live, I believe the Thunder Bay is in a crisis right now, but a crisis of us. our social issues, uh, our police department is in, is a, it's really struggling uh, with uh, it's, um, dealing with uh, systemic racism. Uh, we are, um, we know that we are the murder capital of Canada, the hate crime capital of Canada, our reputation is terrible out there. So if someone's going to come to Thunder Bay, they want to come to a city that um, that is, is safe, that where there's opportunity, where they will be welcomed. And so I believe that we have to change our city in order to become a place that people will want to, to come to. I believe we need to address our social issues. We need to address the issues that are going on in our police department. We need to uh, create an environment that is better for business, uh, where, we're not, uh, uh, where we're encouraging business and supporting our local business community. And, uh, um, and when we do that, we will end up attracting people to come to Thunder Bay. Okay. Our next question, we'll start with uh, Clint. So the 2023 city budget is currently projected at a 4.6% tax levy increase, even before the significant inflation rates that we're now experiencing. What approach would you take as mayor to reduce the burden on business and residential taxpayers? Well, as I said earlier, the cost that we incur, the services that we need to provide, fire department, EMS, police, all banging into each other trying to reach reach a call. And those costs are enormous. The cost with regards to our courts, the cost with regards to our jails, they start to add up to millions and millions of dollars. When you solve those solutions and fix the base of our community, those costs reduce. Right now, the firemen don't want to be doing EMS jobs. The police don't want to be showing up for firemen jobs. When you add up the money that it costs to do that, you reduce that expense, 
it's literally another budget line you get rid of. You end up to the point where you can actually probably reduce taxes because it works quite reasonably. Thank you. Huh. Um, and Thank you. Property tax is too high in Panama. That's why I said people with whom they may not be able to pay, the fix the cost, especially right now, the high inflation, high cost, everything. In the city of Panama Bay, this year they have to pay extra million dollars just for fuel. So we need that it's not just cut down service here at the city, but cut service or increase tax. We can have other resolution. It's my, one of my pillars. Grow. Give me a break. Three years, 0 0.45 is not up. The menace grows for city of Thunder Bay. This is a brutal. This is, a, I feel the guilty for this Thunder Bay, you know, feel very unhealthy. We need the growth. That's why we need the private sector. We need the fresh money to come to Thunder Bay. We need all existing business to grow. So that's it's the key. So that's why we have to, we have to, for the strategy there, manage our money, make it efficient, <laughs> and also it's accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I do believe that the solution has already been presented to our community over the past uh, number of years. And it really, uh, we know that the potential of, uh, is on of developing uh, housing lot uh, development, uh, that that revenue alone would provide millions of dollars. We have had lots of people working on uh, the business, the industrial side of things. And we know that there are several organizations, businesses ready to come here. Uh, it really requires welcome that, good salesmanship from the people tasked with that. But we know with our strengths, for the med school, college, regional hospital, uh, that we can make this an attractive community. So when we look at the negatives, yeah, policing uh, those problems, uh, we're suffering because we're neglecting this one. But with leadership and people pulling together, we can address these the way they're supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you. Gary. We need to reduce our taxes. We need to stop wasting money at City Hall. We just had the uh, core services report done, which offers hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings, and none of that has been actioned yet. We really need to move on those recommendations. We paid a quarter million dollars for that report, and then we've done nothing with it. As, as far as I know, it's sitting on the shelf somewhere. There's lots of cost savings there, but unfortunately, we're going to be making some very difficult decisions, um, and we will have to do that. Soon, uh, a great example is the tugboat that uh, you know, we've spent over a million dollars on that tugboat now. It's sitting on a dry dock, or we're waiting to figure out what we're going to do with it. It's that kind of thing. Right now, we just spent two and a half million dollars to assess whether we need a new police station or not. These are huge expenditures that are coming at the taxpayers uh, from the taxpayers. We can't afford this any longer. We need to run City Hall like a business. We need to, well, we need to, um, be frugal while also taking care of the people in our city that are most vulnerable. Robert? In the past 20 years from 2000 to now, the property uh, cost has gone up close to 200%, whereas wage has gone up roughly 13. The reason people can't afford houses and living is just because, well, they're inflating the housing costs and everything. I feel like if we want to have people have more money and lower property taxes, we should. Instead of building more and more houses, why don't we invest in more apartments that will be uh, more efficient for you know, everyday normal people? And while they're in a lower cost apartment, building up their equity and like some money, they can then start saving up for their own homes. And we can actually have more people buying homes. And let's keep the housing or property tax where it is, but let's invest it smarter. Like uh, my, my friend here said, we're just sitting on so many ideas. Let's do something. Thank you. So still on the financial front, because of course this is a big issue. How would you balance the financial demands of fixing our roads and facilities with the desire for new facilities, for indoor sports or a police station? The first response goes to... 
That's why the growth is the key. We need the support of tax base. Right now, every year we have twenty million dollars. That's tax. That's tax levy and the deficit and the city called gaps. We have eight uh, ten million dollars in re uh, deficit. So we are in big trouble because we don't have enough tax base. So we can't do that. So how can we do that? We have a growth business. Another part, we are looking for the new opportunities. We have uncollect tax. We can collect. It's so typical. But certain thing we can do is collaborate with the up, uh, provincial government, for example, railways. The other provincial, they get the, uh, it's instead of by acres and by the way, they get the actual money. Why can we, the North, can get it? Like a normal, we can talk, negotiate make with provincial, we can get maybe 70, 20 million dollars without risk tax money, tax dollars. So that's very important. That's why we have to jump out the box, rethinking, and we have to have more tax support, and support of tax, and to protect our public services. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The city doesn't have to own every facility. And we know that soccer is not just a game of the future, it's a game of now. So why wouldn't we take uh, a, a low tender that doesn't have a luxury restaurant to compete with our existing restaurants and let someone else do it? We do it all over the province and all over the country. So uh, I can only concur with my colleagues here who, who understand that uh, city owner, ownership and management is not required for a lot of these things, especially uh, if you're going to compete with the private sector. When we want, we know these, these facilities are necessary for, uh, for our community and quality of life, we have to have them. We have so many assets already, uh, trail systems, the things that we have, we count our blessings. We're a very fortunate city for the assets that we do possess. Gary? I've been knocking on lots of doors, and what I'm hearing over and over again from people the concerns are is um, crime, homelessness, and infrastructure. People are really concerned about the doors. I'm hearing it all the time. People are also interested in a sports complex, absolutely. And you know, in uh, Edmonton, they built Canada's largest indoor soccer field for $8 million. That's something that we need to do as a community. We could just do that. That's no problem at all. And so for me, I think what we need to do is focus on what people want city council to be doing. The role of council and the mayor is to bring the concerns of the citizens to administration. What people are concerned about, they're concerned about the roads. That's a huge thing. That's more important from what I'm hearing than any other facility we could have is to focus on the roads. And so as mayor, that's exactly what I'm doing. We're looking to what's going on with our roads here year, year this year is extreme. And something is up with our roads and we need to take a look at that and address that issue. Thank you. Robert. I guess I've been talking to a different group of people because everyone I've spoken to has said turf is a waste of cash. And I totally agree with them. We have a we have a beautiful sports dome at the university, and why don't we work out a deal with the university where we'll pay X amount of thousands per year and have people under eighteen get it for free, so they can have an indoor sports facility for the winter. We don't have to build anything new. We don't have to waste millions of dollars, and they'll be treated. But another thing we're overly ignoring is okay. What about the kids who don't like sports? They they're just kind of left high and dry. So I feel like we should be creating and looking into programs to help all kids, not just those who like sports. And as for the roads, we should start, you, it's one of the things I believe that we should invest into them more now, use better quality, high quality grading uh, construction equipment, so it will last longer. If we invest now, spend more now, we'll save later. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with regards to the sports facility, when the twenty-two million dollar off the table with regards to funding, by the sector funding the show, pretty much needs exactly we need to complete an entirely new proposal and have some new new leaders come in. With regards to the police station, we don't have a new chief, we have a bunch uh, police service board. I think we could probably use the input on that today and actually say whether or not we need one, spending that few point from four million dollars was a shame. Current infrastructure that we have. Like an over park that's been empty pretty much for the last 25 years. Infrastructure that we have in place could be utilized as opposed to building more infrastructure. 
roasting money where we actually have a little bit of construction underneath us. So we had a lot of discussion with regards to sports facilities and event centers over the years where you know, these, these dreams that they want to sort of create without funding. And then we belabor and go on for another three years after the funding has been sort of dissolved. And we're wasting a lot of time. And it's time to use what we have currently now. And then when they come to, when they come with a new plan, a new revenue, for new funding, then we stop with it. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, many of you have uh, talked about the importance of business and growth, so uh, let's talk about that. What steps would you propose to make it easier for Thunder Bay to attract and retain business? And how can City Council support local business success? And the first response goes to King. Ken. The first thing that the Council can do is have an attitude of prevalence that we are a welcoming community for investors. And that is the strongest thing. The attitudinal shift uh, has got to be, Thunder Bay wants you to come here. We want you to bring your families here. We want you to stay here while you're, if you're staging, to go to uh, mining mining uh, operations around here. It, it really comes to attitude. It comes to uh, a prevailing sense that when we list our attributes, we know that it's got to be one of the best places that you can spend in any season. We know we have the schools, the university, the college, uh, our regional hospitals, the med school. When you start totaling this, these things up, we're very strong. Our shopping is great. We, the restaurants, it, it's unbelievable what we, cities we can compete with with our, with our restaurant uh, systems here. So. Uh, Please, we have everything it takes. Nice it up. only requires leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Four years ago, when my husband and I first went into business, I approached the city to get a business license. And I got it in two business days. It was so awesome. I told my friends, and they're like, well, I've gone so quickly. I didn't know what the problem was with dealing with the city. Um, later, when we went to open the second location, I found out exactly what people's problems were with the city. So we faced hurdle after hurdle, and we just couldn't. Uh, we just couldn't seem to uh, please the uh, please them um, well. They just spent quite a bit of money to uh, to end up uh, satisfying all of their uh, all of their needs. So I've heard this uh, anecdotally many times that um, business is being blocked by the city, and uh, we just cannot have them. So what I propose is a, a total review of any of the city departments that interface with business, so that we'll know exactly what is going on, what are the strengths, and where are the areas that we can improve. Um, Another area too is indigenous business. A lot of indigenous business now is going to Manitoba. People do not want to deal with Thunder Bay because of our racist racism issues, because of other issues in Thunder Bay. So that's why I said how to address those issues too. A lot of money being spent in the North Thank you. Thank you. Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel a good thing that the city could do to attract more local businesses from outside of the local region is technologically speaking, we are way behind on the times. Like I looked into Thunder Bay's social media presence and it's non-existent. And when I'm traveling to other cities and I want to like explore local businesses, I'll hop on social media and look at okay, so what's offered here? You go on Thunder Bay's and I don't think anything's been posted outside of the election recently and I think like two, three weeks ago. So we should have a larger social media presence for advertising what we have locally so that we can um, show off what we have, but that'll entice more people to come and it's like, hey, we're we're technologically on, on par with everyone else. We get it, we can hang, because a lot of businesses are moving towards mostly online. And we still want them sort of like originated from Thunder Bay, but we have to show them it's like, hey, we can be an online presence powerhouse too. Thank you. Thanks. Well, you have a culture of saying no. This administration is a, is a challenge. I spoke with Cassio. I think we are moving in the right direction with regards to zoning laws. The businesses that have been turned down, an example would have been Fort Erie Industries that was all ready to go and suppliers built right next to them. Well, a little squabble over green space. Where are they now? They're in Waterloo. Um, you know, I have a question like with regards to brokering deals. There's always a way to say yes, and there's never a reason to say no. We need to stop saying no. And we obviously need to make the city an inviting city to come to. So changing what we look like, 
you know, from their social aspects, they created an avenue where everything's possible and removing any sort of blockades and you know, zoning sort of restrictions. Starting filling the areas like a Nova Park, it could have been filled 20 years ago if we had started saying yes way back then. Thank you. Huh? That's, that's exactly it. Failure must be remembered. So we need a new, bold, bold new vision. We need to have strength, have know how to do attracting people to come here. For example, tourism. We say, oh, we add a test. We don't follow up how many numbers. We need to do is something simple, which is a target. Celebrity. For example, you've had Jackie Chen come here. How many people who know about that living? Something simple, I mean, use that tool and work very well. Another part is uh, talk about indoor turf. I'm very, I don't think this are very angry about this. Three years ago, could have built up a tree indoor turf. Something is wrong. My resolution, why is no transparency? My resolution is the bubble cover the Fort William in the winter and take it down. Zero dollar paid by the city, tax dollar, all by private sector. Why don't we do that? I even dream about it. We put up the proposal already. In the indoor turf, no, in the water park, it's not paid as tax fare, it's paid by private sector. Why not? We can do that. Thank you. Thank you. So another challenge that Thunder Bay has ahead of us is adapting to climate change. Uh, sort of three pieces here. What do you think is our number one asset? What is our number one challenge in addressing climate change? And what would you bring forward to help us weather those climate crises? So we'll start with Gary. Uh, climate change is a, a huge issue for us. Our greatest asset is, I believe, our people, all of us, are really devoted to uh, saving our planet. And um, so our greatest asset as a city is, I think, our willingness and our, um, our desire to, uh, to uh, save the planet. The challenge, of course, is, um, is really um, cost efficiency in impact. We don't want to be spending a great deal of money in order that we don't have. Uh, in order to do that. Um, and uh, the crisis, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to see it when you're here in the Bay. It's so beautiful and uh, so pristine. We really need to preserve uh, the beautiful uh, nature that we have, and also to create a city you know, that's, um, that's full of life. I believe that we should be um, having gardens in our, in our um, uh, everywhere that we can, just beautify the Bay and make it a beautiful, natural place. We'll attract tourists and, um, and just make it a better place to live. Thank you. Robert? Uh, so what I think our greatest asset is to help with climate change is, for lack of a better word, we're in the middle of eight hours of nowhere. We could use a lot of that empty space and make solar and wind farms go lower and actually funnel that power back into the city and help reduce costs of electricity. <laughs> Hydro bills kind of out there. Uh, the challenge will be a lot of people don't like change. They don't like progression. They don't like moving forward. They'll They'll come up with weird and bizarre excuses like, oh, solar panels suck out the sun's energy. <laughs> well, a lot of people have actually said that. Um, so we got we got to uh, fight for the car ability to be greener as possible. And to address the crisis, I think I've had a simple solution. Um, you just said gardening. Um, why don't we plant wildflower seeds on our on our Broadway? Like make it more visually aesthetic and beautiful because Plain old green, but if you have a rainbow of colors in the spring and the summer, oh, that's just gorgeous. Thank you. Clint. Well, there's an organization right now that's been asking questions in regards to how we get about our city. Um, their concern is we don't have areas where we can get from one end of the city, whether they're biking, whether they're rollerblading. You know, with regards to climate, climate change and emissions, with regards to transportation in this community. Uh, we've lacked in the exclusivity with regards to the, the numerous sort of uh, organizations that want to be able to get around the city without having these vehicles. Uh, the idea of, of solar and using solar as opposed to using electrical power. You know, I have friends who have literally completed their entire operation in their home and they're now being paid by hydro as, as opposed to paying out. We need to make the, the city more accessible with regards to using the, sort of the green attitude and getting around the community without using emissions. Take advantage of any solar opportunities that exist when we can you move forward and take that to the next level. Thank you. Huh? 
Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> we must deal with this issue. It's not just for us, for the future. That's why I said running for the future. And we have picked our next generation. We do have a net zero uh, uh, plan, if you read strategy. You see, it's a, just strategy. How can we uh, implement this? I am a Tai Chi guy. Man is approaching, it's always create a really uh, momentum, really situation. Climate change, we can turn negative to positive for sanitary groups. Why? I have recently had a motion called climate refugees. This, we don't prepare for that. And then we're going to get trouble because you couldn't believe many people who move to Thunder Bay. Many people, even, even from survey, from study, from high school in the United States. This is Thunder Bay, the most livable place in the next 100 years. So people, business, they don't do that. Think about it. Some high tech business, they even cool, cooling down their system. They don't have fresh water. They don't have cold weather. We have. So we Thank can take advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure many of you know about my, my background in, in the environmental systems and uh, uh, working with various organizations. So there are two options before us. One is really expensive. One is more cost effective. One is technical. The other is changing human behavior. So for all of these subject materials, heating, roads, transportation, garbage disposal, uh, whether the recycling is going to work. It has to be a whole package. The city has to buy in as a community because there is no longer any sets of options. We can see what's happening uh, to the lake levels before us. We can see how quickly spring comes if you're a skier and, and how late winter arrives if, if you love skiing. So uh, for our transportation systems, uh, personal and public, public it takes leadership to say this is where we want it to go thank you so each of you completed the chamber city of opportunity survey and you've committed to leading by example by fostering trusting relationships among city council members and between council and administration so tell me what specific measures you will take to build respect and collaboration among these groups the first question is for robert I firmly believe that the best way to be a leader is to know how to be a follower. I've done a lot of following. I've been in cadets. I've worked for more businesses than I care to count. I've had great leaders. I've had poor leaders. I've learned from them both of how to properly lead. And I will be by example. One of the things I never see politicians ever do is go, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Unless they're called out on some massive scandal. People make mistakes. People screw up. Uh, the more mature and responsible thing any leader can do is admit that they are only human. And, you know, sometimes people make mistakes. You got to lead by example, too. And so I'd be forgiving. If someone makes an accident or a move, oh, good. As long as no one gets severely injured or anything, we can, we can fumble along the way towards a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Well, you know, facilitation, it's pretty important to build impact. You know, when you're actually building a week, you know, people are actually celebrating the success together. When you're a boss and you just give orders, the end result is people are just taking orders. Um, I've built impact teams where I've seen the, you know, the newspaper industry tying in as everything and, and making sure that everybody's part of the sort of success of, you know, the solutions. It's, it's easy to just say, go do it. But it's a lot better when you actually have inclusion with regards to how the team together can actually build, create the solution, celebrate together. It encourages sort of, it encourages more uh, participation because they're not feeling they're just being ordered or to do something, but people are not part of the solution. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. That's very important. One thing is uh, very important to call respect. In democracy is beautiful. We don't respect without a sincere and, and, and doing things and results as terms that we really cannot accomplish that. Uh, also, myself, you may not know, I'm a trainer, so I'm a teacher. Okay, I'm a, a patient master, I'm a businessman. So, I'm a team leader, also team leader. It goes for a it's a standard way. You start from zero, now it's called the world of Tai Chi. 
capital or the Tai Chi city, even when I have more Tai Chi championship will be in But I'm all in, I will all out. I put my three hundred thousand dollar own money for the city uh, as, 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 as guarantee funding. So I sincere, I want to come with you. So that's why very important part respect and lots of things you have to put on the table. As always, put on the table. Even you don't like it, as debate. If you vote down, then vote down. Democracy is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. It may or can Strength is measured in actions. Uh, leadership as mayor confirms that you have to be participating actively. You have to put your hand in your pocket and support these organizations. You have to be shoulder to shoulder when they're doing events. Uh, you have to be totally committed. Uh, well, it's not regrettably, but it requires a 24-7 commitment. When you're when you're mayor, you're always the mayor. You're not you know, drinking beer and having fun uh, on the corner. Uh, it requires that you support with vigor these organizations that have the volunteer groups out there. It means you have to show the respect that you, if you truly believe in your community that you're there. So you have to demonstrate that care and prove that with many hands, uh, a community is so strong and successful. So as, as mayor, uh, this is what you're going to be doing 24-7, and you have to love it. Thank you. Gary. Uh, building, oh, sorry, Andy. Uh, building respect and uh, collaboration is very important, something that I've done in all of my jobs and in my business now. Uh, as a business owner, I have to encourage people to work hard. We work very hard and uh, sometimes in very uncomfortable conditions with big smiles on our faces, delivering great customer service. That's what we do every day. And in order to do that, I lead by example. I show them by my way of being how we are. And I've uh, led a large organization as well. I do the same thing by just being, uh, by uh, communicating and setting the tone and being an example and leading by example is the way to do that. A city council, we can all work together. It's very easy to find commonalities between all of our platforms. We just sit down and say, let's support each other to do the things that we promise and let's deliver that to our city. Um, to me, it just doesn't have to be confrontational, it doesn't have to be a divisive council. We can have lots of different points of view and still find our commonalities and work together. This is about serving for city. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What can, this first question is, the next question is for Clint, starting. Uh, what can city council do to support groups like the RFDA, Do Drop In, and Roots to Harvest? who are making healthy food more affordable and accessible to our low-income residents. How can the city help? Well, that question, that question has been asked by the organization of, uh, of healthy foods. Uh, we need to work with the farmers so that we're actually producing something in bulk so we can create a, create a sort of an, an environment where people can actually afford to actually eat the food, culturally uh, usable foods. You know, an example is you give somebody a box of Box of bread, dry bread, and they, 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 they prefer something that has a can of chickpea because they know what to do with it. Currently, the RFDA is a system where there's stigma attached, so the individuals would rather starve than actually go and sort of line up in sort of a food line or go to a shelter for food. So, we need to remove the stigma. We need to produce products that actually be cheaper so they don't go and spend you know, $2 for a Tuni Tuesday when they can spend $2 on something that we can produce locally here. Huh? Yeah, thank you. And they've been doing a good job. If they're doing a good job, we can support them. That's why we need the lots of money and in the, uh, uh, generate from the rules for the tax base. And there, I'd like to show you again, this three uh, report. One is a uh, for organization, but uh, that's all on the report, partnership, community partnership. But we do have money every a year without. Point seven million or no, up another partnership and one million. That's let's say two percent of tax land. So we do for talk about food. I'm very passionate about that. I also ask you, I challenge you, everybody have ex experienced starvation. I did. When I was a young teenager, we had no no food on the table. We don't go through that. Hungry people, no food is impossible to me in Canada. We should. Dress this very seriously. 
And beyond that, <coughs> it's, under bay, it's, uh, it's an ideal place to grow healthy food and processed food. It's not just for ourselves, locally, for the internationally. It can be the economic drive engine. That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. This issue now, of course, is predominantly front of mind all over the world. We see what's happening in Ukraine, the issues of supply management between countries used as a weapon between other countries, uh, blackmail essentially uh, supply chains in terms of fuel, uh, transportation, transportation linkages. So here we are in the center of North America, blessed with uh, phenomenally uh, agriculturally rich area. Uh, bordering on the, the bread basket of the world and the prairies. It allows Thunder Bay to take on a singular role of leadership in super stating uh, the need for people to uh, develop the habits, develop the use patterns, and develop the trade systems that allow for equitable distribution, Fair cost I am not. Thank you. Gary? Well, food security is a major issue in, in our city and all, all over. Um, I know many times of parents who have said that they um, do it themselves so they can eat, so their kids can eat. Uh, food and shelter is a, is a basic human right, I believe. And uh, we must ensure that people have uh, a place to live and, uh, and food to eat. That should just be a, a basic baseline. Nobody should be beneath that, uh, that level, of, uh, that level of, uh, of, of standard of living. And so as a city, I think we need to really address these issues. We need to advocate for provincial government. We have to raise the welfare rates. It's just impossible for people to live on such a small amount of money. Um, and the food that is available at that, uh, that affordability level is, is basically really not nutritious. We grow a lot of food locally from the day, but unfortunately, it's out of the price range of people that are, that are living in poverty. Uh, there's a lot we can do to encourage more, um, there's a lot we can do to encourage. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. And Robert. So unlike the majority of people in this room, I've actually had to go to the food bank in my youth because I had the choice of I can afford to live somewhere or I can eat. I didn't have money for food. So I had to go there and ultimately, yes, I did get food, but man, did they make it not that easy because they were only open on a specific day of the week at a specific time. It's like, I still had a job and I could barely afford my rent. I can't afford to take time off to go here and get food. So I feel like they should be up. The system should be reworked so it's easier to be accessible. And like you're saying, uh, a lot of food isn't healthy that we can buy cheap. Like, I still, well, the dough, I, I'm going to the dollar store for most of my meals. And I don't talk to my doctor, they're telling you I'm not doing that great. But I feel like if we made local farm fresh food more available, I could have a healthier diet. People around me could have that healthy diet. And, you know, we wouldn't be getting cancer at 20. Awesome, thank you. Our final question. In recent years, the City of Thunder Bay has worked closely with Fort William First Nation, as witnessed by the joint development of the Anti-Racism and Inclusion Accord and a declaration of commitment between the two communities. What opportunities do you see to further develop the relationship between the City and Fort William First Nation? And we'll start with Paul. That's very important. I describe our relationship is like a lips and teeth. We tie them together. We cannot separate. We have to grow together. This is called real, true reconciliation. Lots of reconciliation. When we talk about the joint the council meeting, talk about how many years? Never happened. If I'm a mayor, it's going to happen right away. And also collaboration for business. I joined their CEDI called Initiative Business Plan. I know lots of potential. They want to lose Good business, we want to do with the city, Thunder Bay, uh, together. But the third issue is trust. We have built up a trust. We have different issues, for example, taxation issue. We have found a solution. How can we work together and move forward? So I'm very good at with them. Reason, I've been working at Fort William First Nation for over 20 years. 
uh, 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 the liquor. So I know how can talk with them, how can build up a trust, and how can we do business together. We create a win-win lips and teeth relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, the, our relationship with the Fairport First Nation is more than just neighbors. And it, it is actually is even more than just partners. Uh, we are essentially uh, going to be in this in the long run. We now know that they have the brains, the influence, the talent. Uh, if our community, through its leader, is sincere, open, and honest, and the councils uh, are collaborating, which they used to do before. I don't know what has happened recently, but our potential together, it's a one-two combination. Stand back. We can do darn near anything. I, I'm really like pumped to get ready and, and work with the chief and their council. We, we really, uh, the world is going to be our oyster, so together we are way stronger than we are as two separate organizations. Thank you. Gary? Our city has continuously made missteps uh, with uh, Indigenous people. And I think our most recently that comes to mind is when the city decided our mascot was going to be Thunder the Bird. Uh, not a Thunderbird, it was Thunder the Bird. And uh, we were told that uh, this idea was run past an Indigenous council, and we found out later that they were when we do things like this, it does not foster trust with Indigenous people. They're, they have great reasons not to trust the city. And things like that just continue to, to drive a wedge in, in, into that. I really believe that we can create a great relationship with Fort William First Nation. In the past, our city council, the, the, the uh, band council and city council used to get together twice a year. They have a meeting, they have a, a lunch, they get together, they share ideas and create a relationship. I think that's really important. I was, I was surprised to know that that had happened before. And I was saddened to, to hear that it, it wasn't happening anymore. I believe that needs to be reinstated right away to have a great relationship. And there's so many. Time's up. Thanks, Gary. Robert? So we're talking with the Aboriginal community in town. I've discovered that our uh, city's Aboriginal liaison has an extremely high turnover rate for the job. And when I asked people about it, they said it's because they're repeatedly ignored. Let's not do that. Let's actually listen to the person whose job it is for us to listen to. And not only that, but you know, actually talk to people as people. Like I hang out in a lot of local smaller areas in town. Uh, Geo and Studio is just a uh, favorite place of mine to go, where they uh, celebrate uh, indigenous communities. They have indigenous art for sale, and they're trying to hire mostly indigenous tattoo artists. Uh, they've talked about how many struggles they've had to go through, especially with the stigmatization of they're seen as quote unquote gangish because they're indigenous and they're a tattoo studio. I would try everything in my heart to, you know, first off, wash away that stigma and be what I want in the community. And you know, if any of the cops are being overly racist, just take them out and fire them. Thank you. Great. Well, one of the years that I was working on boards, one of their biggest challenges was having representation from their indigenous leaders. Uh, the research institute where I saw the education uh, came into play when Stan Beardy joined our board. What happened in the environment of that institution and the inclusion and the input from him in regards to the challenges that they, that they, they come across? They have a lot of money they want to spend, they want to be part of it, but they don't feel that they're included. Uh, the stigma attack with regards to how the police service board has handled that sort of a uh, challenge uh, makes it even more difficult. But, the end result is education with regards to the situations that will occur, inclusion into all of the, the boards and the associations that are important. At the newspaper level, I remember when we had writers and Stan Berry wrote a column and we invited the communities to you know, be part of what it is so they could explain their challenges. But unless you have participation, uh, that education is uh, pretty much stymied. So we, we need to have involvement and they need to come and uh, be part of our community. Thank you. So it's now time for our one minute closing statement. Uh, as the candidates are aware, we're gonna do that in reverse order. So we'll start at the far and move this way to uh, towards me. So uh, one minute closing statement, starting with Clint. 
while the city has uh, failed along the left uh, to elect and attract new business and solve our serious social issues. We all know everything is worse. We created a culture where councillors and mayors would be vacating their seats for better office and failing. And now we want our trust. The head of administration has failed in all categories of the city operation, but you and he's still employed. And also, we were with a 12 percent increase. Provincial and federal officials silenced while citizens are being murdered and dying from lethal drugs brought in by gangs and terrorizing their streets. When I leave here today, I'm going to be going right back down to the encampments where I've been. I'm going to bring some blankets, I'm going to bring some food. I won't be taking any selfies with Bill Ward, but I certainly won't be parading on the street. Leading teams to success in research, healthcare, education, building hospital floors, and being loyal to the actual job. We cannot afford another mistake. And I will continue no matter the outcome to advocate for those that desperately need our compassion and our care. And the business community we need to grow. We need to be open for this and not closed. Thank you, Clint. Robert. Um, I, I've been told my entire life watching TV, media, and even some of the people on this table told me the exact same words of, we need young people in politics. We need young people in politics. Here I am. I'm doing everything in my power to not only make politics more accessible for the youth and the everyday man, but I'm actually trying to change. I am fighting tooth and nail uphill, a losing race, but I'm not going to stop because I genuinely feel this city can be one of the best in the country. But until people decide, it's like, yeah, we need new blood. We need people with different ideas. We need a complete shakeup of the system. No more same old, same old. Let's do something completely different because, well, the same old doesn't work. Is it different? We don't know, but it's better than nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? I decided to run for mayor this year because I realized that Thunder Bay needs to start doing things differently. We need to address the uh, social issues that we have in our city. We need a different kind of energy to be happening at City Hall. We need to uh, just change up the way things are. And I believe I'm the person to do that. I have a, a, a experience and a, a background uh, as a 25 years of social worker, but also as a business owner to uh, bring a sense of, of, of practicality and common sense and to really address those issues. No level of government is going to swoop in here and try to save us. We have to do this ourselves. We have to do this as a community. And I believe that I'm the leader to lead that charge. Thank you very much. A mayor is measured by their actions. You have to get into the community. You have to believe in it. You have to participate vigorously. You've got to put your hand in your pocket when organizations are getting going. You got to show the respect of everyone, every citizen equally. You have to demonstrate that care. You have to have poise, intelligence, and experience to take disparate groups, show them that they're important, and guide them so that we speak with a unified voice to those organizations that we expect to, to respect us. In our community, if the leader acts, then lots of people act. The, the council then acts respectfully. And if they are motivated, the community is motivated. We talk about a can-do attitude. Uh, you have to believe that we know we live in a blessed community. We have lots of potential, and we just need someone to pull this together. And I'm there for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. First, I'd like to congratulate all the uh, candidates for the, the name in the race. That's very important. I respect that. Commitment is more than the outcome to me in my life. Commitment. I commit to do this job. I need to do this job sincerely for the community. I came here with, with my little wife in 1990 with no money, no very little English. I have, we had our dream. By 1992, open the restaurant. So never stop and never give up. And also, it's a community gives me and my family everything. I sincerely I am enthusiastically committed to improve this community. And uh, I cannot do that on my own. I'm asking you, please put your hands out. Everyone, please. Please, follow me, please. 
Come on. Do you understand my English? Follow me, please. Thank you. Let's go. Together we can make a change. Together we can wake up a giant. Together we can make Santa Bay more attractive and a safer city. Thank you. Thank you, huh? Well, that was quite the way, the way to end our mayor's candidate forum. Thank you so much to all of our candidates for participating. I think uh, they deserve a round of applause. It's not easy to sit in this hot seat. It's not easy to put your name forward. Thank you all for being here, for your responses, for thinking through the challenges that face our city and putting forward just some solutions. So thanks for being here. I also want to thank our uh, sponsor, Inner City Industrial, for, uh, for uh, helping to support this event and to everyone that was here today. And of course, voting starts today. So, uh, you can vote online as of today. Information on how to vote and to read profiles for all of the candidates is on the city's election website, tbayvotes.ca.